Hey everybody, this video is called Kor's Rebellion, and tonight we're going to continue our pass-through study here in the 16th chapter of Numbers, where we're going to look at Kor's Rebellion, and we're going to look at ways that we can apply um, the character of Korah among us today, and what we should watch out for as Christians. So let's look at Numbers chapter 16, we'll start in verse 1 through 3 here. It says, Now Korah the son of Izhar the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of re renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take up too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of God? So we're introduced to Korah. He's a Levite, and he becomes friends with the Reubenites and other leaders in Israel within this chapter. And we see that Korah leads an instigation and an organized opposition to the authority of Aaron and the priests. And they argued that by claiming the unique right and responsibility to represent the people of, before God. And they accuse them of taking too much upon themselves based on the promise that all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. And Korah descended through Kohath, who had significant duties at the tabernacle, as you see back in Numbers chapter 4. And however, we see he desired further to be a priest, as you'll see when we move down into verse 10. And Moses also descended from Kohath, but he descended through the son of Amram, whereas Korah was through Izhar in verse 1. And Korah means baldness. So we could say, you know, this old, this old bald guy gave Moses a tough time. But now he accused Moses of prideful leadership. Does that sound familiar? We remember Merimim back in chapter uh, 12, was it? And his accusation was made publicly in front of the people of Israel. And he gathered 250 men as he's bringing a drawing to himself. And these people that look to, you know, criticize every single thing, and that's all they ever do is they criticize, you know, other people in the faith 100% of their time. They're really just looking to draw a following up among themselves. And Korah attacks and he acts if he represented the people and he fought for their interests. So, you know, he wants to look like the good guy. He wants to look like he cares for them, but he really doesn't care for these people. And Korah only truly desired a following and a position for himself. And Korah proclaims the holiness of the people, and he regarded strong leadership as unnecessary at the very time when the nation of Israel was in need of strong leadership. And we know that Israel was not holy from chapters 11 through now. They haven't been holy, and they desperately need strong leadership. And Korah pushed this baloney because he was not a true shepherd. And we're going to see throughout Israel's history, as you move through the Old Testament, that there were many false shepherds that rose up among the nation. And in verse uh, 4 through 11, it says, So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and that will cause him to come near to him, that one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this, take censers, Korah, and all your company, put fire in them, and put incense in them, before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, 
Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore you and your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? So we see, we know from, what was it, chapter uh, 12, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, that Moses was the most humble man among Israel. So he's humble here, and he first prays before he confronts them. And he likely prayed for God to spare the nation from these men who were, the purpose of them was to bring division among the, the, the people. And then we see Moses challenges Korah and his followers. He doesn't ignore them, but he gives them, you know, a run for their money. And when people rise up that all they do is bring division and they don't stand on God's word, they need to be stood up to at times. But we see that uh, Korah and his followers come back before the Lord with Moses and Aaron and God lets God sorts it all out and God sorts out who would be the leaders for himself and Moses had no concern of the outcome and he knew that the rebellion of Korah was rooted among ingratitude and they weren't grateful for the wonderful ministry that God gave them to do in the tabernacle they went out and did their own thing and Moses rebukes their pride and their self-serving, uh, self-seeking challenge. And Korah had other Levites involved in the rebellion, you know, the 250. And so verse uh, 12 through 14, it says, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into the land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So Dathan and Abram were two men of the tribe of Reuben who despised Moses by blaming him for taking Israel out of the land of Egypt and failing to bring them into the land of Canaan. So we see, you know, finger pointing going on here. You know, blame it all on Moses that this has not been a smooth journey. And their perceived failure of Moses caused them to attack Moses and join with Korah in rebelling against Moses and Aaron. And these two men would not meet with Moses nor answer his challenge. But they chose just to continue accusing Moses instead. And you can see that among us today, even within people that profess to be believers. That there's, you know, tons of finger pointing and nobody wants self-accountability. When you're challenged, nobody wants to respond, you know, with grace and actually stand on the word of God. And they throw Moses pass back in his face and they would not submit to Moses and you know so we see that too that Moses as a leader he's getting attacked and one thing that people like to do with church leaders is they'll bring up you know their past before they were even a Christian you know how can we respect this you know pastor because I used to party with him when we were in our 20s stuff like that in verse uh, 15 through 19, it says, Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. 
And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. So Moses, he pled his innocence with God before the Lord. And he claimed to have been a true servant leader. So Moses knows that he is not in the wrong here. And this to me confirms, as I mentioned earlier, Numbers 12, 3, where Moses calls himself the most humble man on the earth. And Moses was angry about what these men have done, that these men have brought division and have brought hardship. But Moses isn't going to get confrontational with them in the sense of getting physical or yelling. He's going to leave it to the Lord to deal with, for the Lord to take vengeance. And Moses could rest in his clean conscience before God. And we see that the challenges of censors of incense, as God would approve or disprove of these 250 men gathered before the door of the tabernacle. And a censer was a metal pot used to burn incense. And they were used in the priestly worship of God. And since Korah and his minions questioned Moses and Aaron's right to lead the nation and to conduct their priesthood, each group would have to come to the Lord as worship and priests, and God would show them uh, which group he accepted. And in verse uh, 20, 21, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. So we see that basically in verses 20, 21, that God is saying to Moses, like, Hey, Moses, get out the way. You know, please move. These rebels are going to get it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm at wit's end with these rebels. And I'm going to bring judgment upon them. So in verse 22, says, Then they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation. So the God of the spirits of all flesh appears only here in one other spot in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 27, verse 16. So Moses is calling on the omniscient, the all-knowing God, who knows the heart of everyone, and he's coming to judge those who had sinned and only those. And we see that the love of Moses, who prayed for mercy on those who were deceived under Korah. And Moses was transformed into the image of Jesus before Jesus walked the earth. Because we're going to see Moses was a man that interceded on behalf of the nation, even when they were at their rock bottom with God. And, you know, Moses is a great example that even when people rise up against us or, you know, the church leaders that are, you know, actual church leaders, we'll get into, you know, a little bit later, you know, uh, there is, you know, where we have to judge church leaders based off their conduct and what they're preaching from God's word. But for now, you know, we're focusing on those who are attacked, you know, accused falsely. But we see the love of Moses who prayed for mercy for those that were deceived under Korah. And, you know, many times today we see Christians, they, you know, they'll attack people that are following bad leaders in the church and, you know, instead of showing grace or even giving them the opportunity to show them the truth that, you know, hey, you're following a wolf, watch out, you know, they go straight attack mode. And in ver uh, verse 23 through 35 here, it says, good length of verses. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abram. And Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. And Dathan and Abram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them on my own will. 
If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth, and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men of Korah and all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry for they said lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. So it's a very graphic passage here that we just went through in these 12 verses. But God judged those who rebelled against Moses and Aaron by putting them to death. And remember the appointed elders back in Numbers chapter 10, the elders that were appointed for Moses. We see that Moses was attacked on his leadership then too, when God appointed the elders to help him. And the elders were men with the same spirit and the same vision of Moses. They were on the same accord with Moses and they were to help him bear the burden. And we know that the elders stood faithfully with Moses and they fulfill God's purpose for them. And Moses, in response to God's command to get away from the tents of the leaders of the rebellion, pled with the people to separate themselves from these 250 divisive persons under Korah. And God gave Moses supernatural insight to know that some special judgment was going to come upon Korah, Datham, and Abram. And the earth would open and swallow these rebels as a sign of God's wrath in the accusation of Moses and Aaron. So Moses and Aaron are proven innocent and the rebels families would also be destroyed. However, now you might be wondering about their families because uh, when you, uh, their children, because you hear the word families, that their families were destroyed with them. Later on in Numbers chapter 26, verse 11, it indicates that the children were exempt from the judgment. And God had judgment reserved for those who walked in agreement with Korah, not, uh, just not as a horrific as the judgment that Korah himself received. And in verse uh, 36 through 40, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy and scatter the fire some distance away, the censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, because they presented them before the Lord. Therefore they are holy, and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out of, as a covering on the altar, to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. So the 250 leaders of Israel brought the censers filled with fire before the Lord, and the censers were holy to the Lord since they had been used in the tabernacle. And therefore, Eleazar was commanded to hammer out the metal censers into a covering for the altar. And that covering was to be a reminder that God had chosen Aaron and his descendants for the priesthood. And the censers were to be a memorial and to serve as an important reminder that God is the one who appoints the leaders and that no one should be divisive rebels like Korah. And now in Hebrews edition of the Old Testament, verse 36 would actually start in chapter uh, 17. In verse uh, 41 says, 
On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. So, poor Moses, he cannot catch a break through this entire time. And when the rebels were judged, he probably hoped that the worst was over, that trouble was over. But now he has to deal with those who were sympathetic to the divisive people and they felt sorry for these divisive people that had the judgment poured out on them and what an insane accusation they made here and when the earth opens up and swallows 250 people i don't think moses hand had anything to do with it i don't know any man on earth that could open up this earth and swallow people all at once but we believe it's a supernatural work through the hand of God. And in verse uh, 42 through 45, it says, Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. So God reacts toward the sympathizers as he did towards Korah and his minions. And they deserve to be judged next. And we see a difference though that the people of Israel then humbles themselves as they took the threat of judgment seriously. In verse uh, 46 through 50, the rest of the chapter, it's a very long chapter, but this is some really good stuff in these few chapters here in Numbers. It says in verse 46, So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation. Make atonement for them, for the wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. So Moses and Aaron, they go on to intercede for the entire nation, that, and it saves them from destruction because of their opposition toward God. And Moses tells Aaron to offer incense to make atonement for the congregation. And Aaron moves in a sense of urgency with the censer, with burning incense to stop the plague. But we see that the plague still, in the meantime, took 14,700 lives, but not the whole nation was consumed. And we see that God will have mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy. And the wrap up here, we see that Korah and his followers, they oppose Moses' leadership as they raise accusation against Moses and Aaron. And there are Korahs even among us today who build up supporters for themselves. They build up their own little gang and they lack discernment. The people that fall for these people, they lack discernment in seeing who they really are as troublemakers. And we saw Moses' response to Korah and his minions. And then we see Datham and Abram speak for the rebels. And when challenged, you find that the Korah and supporters, they choose not only to accuse, but they won't even answer a question when they're challenged. And yes, we ought to hold church leaders accountable. We got to hold them to a higher standard because we know from 1 Timothy chapter 3, we know all the, the guidelines that God said, you know, my leaders should meet this criteria. And they should be held to a high standard on what they teach. You know, we need to be Berarians in Acts 17, 11, where we need to be in the Word of God, and we need to be cross-examining those who we listen to if they're actually preaching from the Word of God or for their own personal gain. But it is unfair to hold one to a perfect standard. And oftentimes, Korah supporters, they don't have any encourage 
You know, they're usually weak in the faith. They don't have courage to speak up to their, the one that they're following that, like, hey, you know, you're wrong on this matter. And what they must understand is that silence is a sign of agreement. And if a godly leader is falsely accused and you say nothing, then you are just as if you're in the same sin as the accuser. And we see Moses reestates his challenge. And Moses is a great example of a godly leader. And I love going through the Old Testament and looking at the, the leadership of Moses. We see that Moses got angry, but he left the accusers in God's hand. And shepherds should be passionate against wolves who would otherwise injure the flock. And Moses reminds me of the Apostle Paul. And I want to go over to go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 26. So Acts 20, 26, it says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves, you yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased this with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among them, men will rise up speaking perverse things to what? To draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So this is Paul's testimony before the Ephesian elders. And Paul recognizes his innocence and his clear conscience. And when leaders are troubled by a rebellious or a divisive people, it is glorious to have a clean conscience. If they know they're right with God, humbly, it's good to have a clean conscience. And we see God announces judgment on the rebels as he affirms Moses' leadership over the nation of Israel. And we saw Moses and Aaron's intercession for Korah and the rebels. So even though these men were evil and rose up against them, they still had a heart toward their enemies and they prayed for their enemies. And we see the importance of prayer and we see the importance of prayer, but we also see God's judgment on the rebels. And as Christians, we need to stay away ourselves from divisive people who wish only to argue as they will influence you. And if all they do is go around looking for arguments 24-7, they don't want to encourage the body of Christ. They don't want to edify the body of Christ. They don't want to stand on God's word. And all you see is, you know, they're just behind a keyboard or whatever, just picking arguments and attacking every single thing that you can think of. They never share the gospel. Those are all red flags that you need to distance yourself from those types of people. And like I said, there is nothing wrong with calling out a wolf, you know, when they're actually a wolf. But anytime you call somebody a false teacher or whatever, you better have backup to point out exactly, you know, that they actually said it. Don't just go with, you know, hearsay because your favorite people on Facebook said, you know, oh, they said this. You know, you should find those video clips and all that yourself and look for the full context of what's said. But, you know, that's red flags if people are just looking to attack all the time and not stand on the other things on the Word of God and encouraging others. And I want to go over to Titus chapter 3. We are given guidance on how to handle people like that. 
So Titus chapter 3, we'll look at verses 10 and 11. Or, well, verse 9 through 11. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So they will never recognize or claim to be divisive. People that are Akoras, they will not recognize what they're doing. And they'll think that they're doing a service for God. And we need discernment of not just what others say, but what they do. You know, somebody could be 100% accurate on what they preach about the Word of God, but if they're living a life that's opposite, you know, you got to question, you know, if there's no fruits in that person. And oftentimes, their own families will also suffer as a result of their actions. And then, you know, so back in Numbers chapter 16, we saw the bronze covering for the altar, and we saw once again the people murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the threat of judgment came upon them for their sympathy of Korah. And the chapter ends with Aaron's intercession, uh, stopping the plague of judgment against the children of Israel. And we see that even though 14,700 people died in the plague, that God showed mercy on whom he chose to show mercy that that time. And I want to go over one more passage, Revelation chapter 8. I'm actually over the 30-minute marker, so you might be going nuts with me. But, you know, the thing with the Word of God is you preach the standard, not to time. So, you know, if it's a long chapter, it's going to be a longer video. So, Revelation chapter 8 verse 3 and 4 it says then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before god from the angel's hand so incense in the new testament in revelation we see it's a picture of of prayer and may we pray serious as if we're praying in a life and death situation every time we pray we should be praying hard and you know not re rep rep repetitively or babbling you know we need to be very serious when we go to pray so i hope today's word has been encouragement for you hope it's a self-examined point maybe you got toxic people in your way that you know they might be biblically 100 percent smart but they are showing appearance more like a Korah rather than a, you know, as, as you know, a leader of Christ or a follower of Christ. So that's going to wrap up this video. We'll see you next week in chapter 17. So I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. God bless.